Hi, I'm Lewis Jett, WVU Extension Commercial Horticulture Specialist, and we're at the WVU Horticulture Organic Farm in late summer, early fall, and we're going to talk about a series of pest management issues that high tunnel growers have in West Virginia and Mid-Atlantic region. High tunnels are controlled environment greenhouse structures that are not quite greenhouses in the sense that they, they don't use um, artificial heating or electrical fans but are just passively heated or passively vented and the, the crops that we grow in these structures are grown directly in the soil underneath of the, of the structure. So many high tunnels are being used in West Virginia for year-round food production and as we expand the number of crops that we grow in high tunnels we continue to see new pest problems. So we're starting a series of videos to look at specific pests that we have in high tunnels and we're starting with with insect pests that we have um, in high tunnels in West Virginia. Some of the most common insect pests that we have seen in West Virginia uh, high tunnels to date have been whiteflies, aphids, thrips, flea beetles, cutworms, stink bugs, and other, other smaller insects uh, species and also other species no, that are not insects such as spider mites. So we'll attempt to address the management uh, of each of these insects uh, and other pests throughout the course of time and throughout the seasons of the year because some of these pests uh, are more prevalent during different seasons of the years and even with specific, specific crops. So our first series of uh, discussions on pest management starts with Dr. Carlos Quesada who is a WVU Extension Entomology Specialist and we will look at white fly management in high tunnels. Well, white flies are uh, most, uh, one of the most important agronomical pests. Um, they are part of the true bugs. Insects, true bugs is um, the common name for hemipterans. Um, they are close related to aphids. Well, true bugs have uh, incomplete metamorphosis. That means that uh, they have uh, three different life stages, uh, eggs, nymph and adults. Uh, white fly um, are a little, a little different than most of that um, incomplete metamorphosis insects. So they, when they hatch from their eggs, the nymph uh, will crawl. Uh, usually they crawl short distance on, on the same plant. And, uh, but the difference with these uh, pests is that once they find a place where they settle and they feed, the nymph don't move again until they became adults and then the adults are very mobile but uh, the nymphs are only mobile during uh, that short period of time that are called crawlers. According with the temperature, white flies can uh, complete the life cycle. When I say complete, this means from eggs to adults that can reproduce eggs and uh, that can vary from uh, two to five weeks depending on the temperature of, uh, of the high tunnel or, or greenhouse. Uh, white fly, there are about 1,500, 1500 uh, species of white flies worldwide, but here in this uh, part of the country, there are uh, three uh, common species. They are um, the sweet potatoes white fly, the greenhouse white fly, and the bended winged white fly. Well, uh, white flies uh, affect the plants in three different ways. So uh, the first is they are soaking insects. So that means that nymphs and adults have a mouth part that is introduced on the leaves and they suck that liquid of the plant. So that's the first way by you know reducing all the nutrients of, of the plant. The second way is white flies and other insects such as aphids, um, scale insects produce a honeydew. This honeydew um, as you can see over here so the honeydew will produce a fungus uh, that is called city mold. So this uh, fungus will not affect the leaf uh, directly, but 
uh, it will cover part of the leaf and that will reduce the photosynthesis of the plant. So by reducing the photosynthesis of the plant, then uh, plant uh, vigor is also uh, is, is, is reduced. And the third uh, way of how white flies can affect uh, plant is by transmitting diseases. So there are some viruses that uh, cannot go from one plant to another, but when one white flies feed on the plant that is infested with uh, by that's diseases, then uh, we'll transmit those diseases to other plants. And that will be the third way. Yes, um, just to give you an example, uh, sweet potato white fly will feed in more than 700 different species and they will prefer some of the other. And um, as you mentioned before, uh, white flies may prefer uh, beans and um, uh, tomatoes over other species, but they, they might, um, Chances are you will have some of um, weeds around your uh, high tunnel that can host uh, white flies because, like I mentioned, they feed on many different plant species. That's a good question. Um, before mention, before answering, I just want to say that uh, the more you uh, look for white flies, that the more often you look for them will be the faster you will find them. And then if you find them quickly before they reproduce and they are a problem, it will be the easier to uh, control them. Also, the more plants that you look at it, the more probabilities of finding them. So uh, the way that you can see them um, is by looking under, under the leaf because they place uh, their eggs under the leaf and also uh, most of that, uh, the nymph will stay there. Um, that's one way. Another way is looking for honeydew uh, and sooty molds. That will be another way. And the last way will be uh, using a sticky car, uh, just uh, like this one right here. So uh, sticky cars are a good uh, way to scout for white flies. Okay, um, we can uh, use conventional insecticide, and um, basically we can divide them to, de we can divide conventional insecticide in three uh, groups. So the first group will be a broad spectrum insecticide. Those are insecticide that can kill many different insects. Uh, we try to avoid them because uh, those insecticides will also kill the natural enemies. And then in the future, you can have other uh, white fly outbreaks or other pest outbreaks, for example, spider mite, because you are killing uh, spider mite natural enemies. And the other group can be insect growth regulators. Uh, those are a little uh, less harmful to natural enemies, and that's what we recommend. And uh, that third group will be, we can call them rational insecticide, which uh, have uh, insecticidal soup and uh, ornamental oils or oils that are based on, on plant materials. So uh, this group, oils and soaps, are, uh, can kill natural enemies also when they have a direct contact with them, but the residues is very short. So once they are dry, uh, they are safe for natural enemies. And if you want to uh, know uh, more specific uh, products, you can visit uh, our guy to uh, check for more uh, specific insecticide that you can use. So biocontrol is the use of organisms uh, to control some pests. So they can be uh, predators, as you mentioned, or parasitoids or, pato or pathogens. So the predators that are commercially available to control wildflies are lacewing, lacewing pirate bugs, and uh, uh, ladybugs. So these, those three uh, have a generally 
uh, feeding behavior. That means that they will feed on wildlife, but also can feed on um, scale insects or aphids. So the other group are parasitoids, and they are wasps that feed on um, wildflies. And the most uh, commercial commercially used are here in that screen. In culture, it will be more effective to control greenhouse wildfly, whereas this other uh, wasp is uh, more effective to control sweet potato wildflies. The other group are uh, pathogens. So there is a uh, Bauberia bassiana that is commercially available that you can use uh, to control um, this uh, wildfly. Bauberia bassiana is a fungus um, that is naturally found in the soil, but uh, you can buy it uh, commercially and apply just like you apply your other pesticide. Uh, yes, uh, usually predators are effective when the pests uh, are in low populations. So that's why uh, scouting is very important. So uh, you can find those pests before they uh, have, have a high population on, on your crops. So uh, usually the best um, time to release them is in the beginning of the season, right after you plant uh, is the best time to uh, release some, some predators or natural enemies. And then um, during the season, if you're scouting, uh, you can release more of those when you start finding this pest that, uh, in your greenhouse. That's, that's a great question. So um, it's important to distinguish these species because, uh, for example, that sweet potato whitefly, um, they have these subspecies that are tolerant or have resistant to insecticide. And also uh, some of the natural enemies uh, prefer to feed on some species than other ones. So let's start with the um, bended winged whitefly. And this is uh, easier to tell apart from the other two because they have some uh, spots on their wings and that's why they get their names. So the other two are a little more uh, difficult to, uh, to uh, distinguish between the two of them. When that wise are resting, the greenhouse whiteflies will uh, flat their wings and they will have a shape like this. Whereas uh, the uh, sweet potato whitefly will have a shape more um, like an angle. So that's one way to separate the greenhouse whitefly from the sweet potato whitefly. Another way is when you see them from the top, the greenhouse whitefly will form a triangle from the head to the wing, whereas that a uh, sweet potato whitefly will uh, form more like an oval shape. So, and the last, uh, if you see that immature stages, that greenhouse whiteflies will have different hairs on their nymph, whereas the uh, sweet potato whitefly have a very few hairs or none. Yes, they can sell us samples to the uh, Diagnostic Clinic Lab, and the address is in, in the screen. Another strategy for controlling whiteflies in high tunnels, maybe before they start emerging as a major pest in the high tunnel, is some of the cultural control measures. So it's very important not to over-fertilize um, the plants, the crops that you're growing in a high tunnel, specifically with nitrogen. Over-fertilization with nitrogen really flares up problems with white flies and also other pests such as aphids. So it's really important to follow the nutrient management guidelines for the specific crops that you're, you're working with. Uh, temperature management is also very important because many of these pests thrive in very high temperature environments and it, it really accelerates their life cycle. So it's extremely important to keep the temperature at the level that's optimum for growing the crop. Preventing temperature spikes uh, will help control some of these pests as well. And then also it's important to start from the, uh, the, the establishment 
uh, phase of the crop. So if you're bringing in transplants from another greenhouse uh, that maybe you own or from another commercial greenhouse that you're buying plants from, be very careful to inspect those plants for white flies and other pests that will jump onto the crops as they grow and other, other crops that you have in the high tunnel throughout the growing season. Also, we recommend that you keep high tunnels uh, as weed free as possible. So um, uh, baseboard to baseboard, a mulch is, is recommended. That can be a synthetic mulch, such as a plastic or a woven plastic material, but also can be organic mulches as well. But it's very important to keep weeds under control because many of these pests, insects and diseases, will often have host, uh, weed hosts. So you need to keep those under control. We recommend when you transition from one crop to the next, you have a two week crop free period between crops in your high tunnel. This will prevent a lot of the pests from jumping from one crop to the next crop. So a two week um, interval between crop cycles is what we, we recommend. And during that time, the high tunnel or greenhouse can be closed and allowed to heat up to sort of kill anything that may be trying to survive in the structure. And then also it's very important to keep weeds under control around the perimeter of the structure. Uh, we recommend a 10 to 15 foot weed free uh, perimeter around high tunnels and greenhouses to control some of these pests. So we heard a lot of good information today about controlling white flies in high tunnels. It starts you know, from cultural control practices and also goes into you know, detecting the, uh, the pest before it becomes a major problem. And Carlos uh, recommended rele uh, releasing biological predators to control these pests before they emerge as a major problem. Chemicals are a last resort in the high tunnel or in the greenhouse. So when the problem becomes to the point where it's not able to be controlled culturally or biologically, the chemicals can be used for that control. All this is a multi-pronged approach to control pests that we call, we call Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. So we highly recommend that growers follow these recommendations throughout the course of the growing season to manage pests such as white flies.